Well, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for joining me today. Today I'm going to talk about Q2 for Synovus Energy, but before we start, I um, wanted to share this slide here um, just to let you know that the information shared is uh, aggregated from the public domain. So I just basically collect a bunch of information and this should be used for educational purposes only and uh, not intended as and shall not be understood or interpreted as investment advice, please. So um, please do your own due diligence and talk to a professional advisor regarding any investment strategies. I think it's really important. And um, yeah, let's just start. Uh, this is for educational purposes only. Uh, one hour, um, just reviewing Q2 for Synovus, trying to understand what to place in this quarter, and uh, really kind of see what, uh, if, if there's anything exciting about this company, I think there, there's lots uh, and looking forward to adding significant amount of value. So what we're going to do going forward, we're going to uh, do comparisons between the different companies. Um, we're going to also uh, take a look at the specifics about kind of uh, where the company is heading, what was their Q2 performance, uh, see some reviews about the company and also do a deep dive into their Christina Lake asset, which is their jewel asset uh, uh, for thermal activities. So as you can see on this graph, this is essentially now a $48.4 billion company uh, when it comes to market cap. They do have about $8 billion or so in debt and just over $6 billion in net debt. And so the overall enterprise value for this company, let's say, is about $55 billion. So and as you can see in this chart, this is one year performance. So basically kind of uh, was declining with the, oil, with the oil prices, but over the past, uh, you know, but it's still up, you know, 23%, right? So over the past three years though, it's up 300%. And over the past five years is up uh, 93%. But then if you look at the 10 year chart, obviously, oh, chart not available, but, um, it basically kind of, uh, I think maybe uh, maybe flat or or slightly down even. So on relative basis, if we if we do a one year comparison here with some names that uh, I selected uh, to compare Synovus with, we can see that over one year Synovus is up 16%, Meg is up um, is 52% on relative basis, uh, Suncor five, CNQ 20, and Imperial Oil 30. And I think that's kind of why Suncor been uh, in the situation a little bit with activism and such, because it's always compared to CNQ, as it's seen here, CNQ kind of outperforms, especially I think on a three-year chart. So if you see here, Suncor did basically 90% and CNQ did two times the money, where uh, Sonovus was up three times. And so that's why I think there's a little bit of a pushback. But today we're gonna be talking in detail about Sonovus. Uh, over six months is down a little bit. But, you know, if I was to compare Synovus, uh, I would compare it. It's kind of a, like a much bigger version of Imperial, I would say. And you can see on performance is slightly down 2% over six months. And Imperial is up 2%. SNQ is also up 2%. So, uh, you know, you kind of move with the oil prices a little bit. But, uh, you know, looking forward, kind of sharing a little bit more about what the company been up to and, and where it possibly going to go from here. So... Now, as uh, now, uh, I'll share the presentation for uh, Synovus, and we're kind of going to go going to go over uh, some more things in detail about um, where where the company's current standing is based on the corporate corporate presentation, and after that, we could review their um, Q2 performance. So as you can see here, and uh, they've been reporting basically uh, Q2. And based on what they're showing here for corporate presentation, they say it's $45 billion company market cap, but now it's about 48. And production 785,000 BOEs per day. So they produce oil and gas, but mainly oil as, as seen here in oil sense, their production is about 600,000 barrels a day. So that's a massive, massive uh, producer. And a lot of their production, I think uh, maybe about 230,000 barrels a day, even more comes from the Christina Lake asset. And today we're going to review some of the presentation from the public domain uh, associated with Christina Lake. We're going to review the, 
the disclosed in situ progress report that was re reported to the regulator AER uh, for the in June 2022 update. So looking forward to sharing that. And you can see they also have conventional business. So they produce 123,000 barrels per day uh, in conventional and not even offshore 62,000 barrels per day. And they're very much like fully integrated here because you can see they have upgrading and refining capacity of 745,000 barrels per day. I think it's really important to kind of keep things in context where, you know, the United States uh, uh, products demand is about 20 million barrels a day. And here I have a company that kind of refines, upgrade and refines 745,000 barrels per day on their capacity. So that's, that's great. So in 2022, their proved and probable reserves are 8.9 billion barrels, uh, which, which is significant, which, which uh, essentially reserves life index of 31 years. And here you can see the map of uh, basically what, uh, what they're producing and what they're refining. And so you can see kind of the network between their assets. So essentially they have uh, in the conventional side, you can see Rainbow Lake, the deep basin side, uh, which some of some of it was divested um, back in, I think, 20, 2019, 2020, something like that. But uh, they do remain, uh, there is a position still there. They do have this Bruderheim uh, oil by rail terminal and significant thermal operations uh, at Sunrise, Christina Lake, Foster Creek. So Foster Creek is the first SEGD asset, first commercial SEGD asset in Alberta. So lots of legacy operations there in Christina Lake, which is their jewel. Um, lots of midstream activities here, yielding to Lloyd upgrader and refinery. So creating that synthetic crude, um, superior refinery to leader refinery, Lima refinery in the United States with river refinery and border border refinery. So uh, all of those are very much like important assets and just kind of provide a quick overview of, you know, in overall what they're all about and they have the way they can disclose their information they do have a several uh, segments in their business and so the first segment will be uh, the upstream segment so in the upstream segment essentially they uh, develop and produce bitumen and heavy oil in northern alberta and saskatchewan so their assets uh, include foster creek christina lake uh, sunrise lord mr thermal lord mr conventional heavy oil assets and they have also a network of pipeline gathering systems. Now, on the conventional sides, they have uh, assets that are rich in the NGL, so natural gas liquids, and natural gas within Elmworth, Wapiti, uh, Cape Up, Adson, uh, and Clearwater, and Rainbow Lake operating areas in Alberta and BC, and interest in numerous uh, natural gas processing facilities, which is amazing. Now, offshore, they include offshore operation, exploration, and development activities. Uh, they have some activities in China, East Coast of Canada, uh, as well as equity accounted investment in Husky, Sindhu, Madura. So that, that's from the upstream segment. So that's basically oil production. And downstream, which is their refining capabilities, that do have two business kind of be used, uh, Canadian manufacturing. So um, they, they disclose here that they operate Lord, Lord Mr. Operating Asphalt Refining Complex which converts heavy oil and bitumen into synthetic crude, diesel, asphalt, and other uh, products. Uh, they own and operate Brotherheim crude by rail terminal and ethanol plants. In the US, they operate, as mentioned here and shown on the map, um, refining of crude oil produce gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, asphalt, and other products wholly on Lima Superior to later refineries and jointly owned Wood River and Borgia refineries. Uh, with Philip 66. So significant kind of capabilities here um, wh when it comes to their, uh, you know, uh, abilities to to not only produce oil, but deliver oil to markets and uh, provide that value that, uh, that that society demands. Now, if we look at the second quarter 2023 results, you essentially have net earnings of 866 million in Q2 only. Uh, which is uh, quite significant, right? We're soon we're going to see like the free cash flow and their more in-depth kind of uh, numbers. But upstream production was 730,000 barrels per day. Uh, downstream throughput was 538. Uh, cash from operating activities was almost $2 billion. Adjusted fund flow was $1.9 billion. Free fund flow was 897. Uh, I think previous quarter it was uh, 
it was uh, a little bit lower. I think it was lower, but as oil prices were higher, it was I think free funds low, like free cash flow was uh, close to even two billion dollars, which is uh, remarkable. Th this is important, right? So uh, capital investments is about a billion here, but when it comes to net debt, it's about six point three. So if they trade at uh, let's say forty eight billion market cap. That's a 55, 56 billion dollar enterprise value company, and long term debt is 8.5 billion dollars. So I think it's it's kind of really important to keep um, uh, keep this uh, in mind because uh, one could say, well, what's what's kind of the value of this company in per flowing per per, uh, per, per barrel metric? And so if you think about this, so if you say let's say um, you produce 730 thousand BOEs per day. And um, let's say you account for the downstream business, maybe 270,000 BOEs per day equivalent. I know it's a very awkward way of looking at this, but let's just for this exercise, assume that the entire, the entire kind of downstream business is, um, if you were to kind of translate its value to upstream, will cost maybe $270 million, right? Yeah, sorry, 270,000. Uh, barrels of production and i do it for just a kind of um for an example to to showcase like maybe where the value of sonova lies so let's say in overall the the value there is let's say thousand um one million barrels per day boes per day equivalent on production let's say okay so then if you trade at 55 billion your metric the metric per flowing suggests you're trading at 55,000 per flowing but obviously, I oversimplified it because all of their, this network, it's probably not, um, it's probably worth way more than just like, let's say, Christina Lake or Foster Creek that produces over 200,000 barrels per day. And so I think it's important to, to kind of keep it in context that kind of, at least when I'm looking at this name, you know, that 748,000 barrels per day capability to refine and upgrade capacity through Toledo, Superior, Wood River, uh, Lima and Loya operator uh, should be worth way more than uh, 270,000 BOEs equivalent on the upstream side. Therefore, the company, you know, should trade at uh, more than 55,000 per flowing. Um, but reality is, is that, um, you know, kind of that's where the enterprise value is right now, which suggests maybe this company is uh, a little bit undervalued here. So, as we look uh, at the net uh, net debt, um, you know targets here. What what's basically the the framework um, associated with capital capital allocation priorities? So you, they basically tell you here that um, if they're over a billion dollars in net debt, then basically 100% of the excess free funds flow, uh, which is essentially their cash cash flow goes to uh, net debt reduction. But as we've seen in this slide right here, uh, the net debt is 6.36 billion, right? So let's kind of consider that. And this is mo mostly falls within that second kind of stage where um, the, the net debt is in that range. So what's going on in that range? So basically they're telling us that the leverage ratio net debt to adjusted fund flow is one to two, which is which is the case. And so right now, up to 50% net debt reduction uh, from the uh, excess free funds flow and target 50% shareholder return. So they're becoming here opportunistic share buybacks and or variable dividends. So they do pay a small dividend, but um, it seems like their, their program suggests that 50% of the free cash flow is allocated to net debt and 50% is allocated to return value to shareholder in the form of buybacks and uh, perhaps uh, variable dividends. Now, once they reach the four billion uh, net debt target, so we we see they're not there yet. So uh, basically, they're at six point three six billion. Uh, what's the plan then? So they say we're going to return target one hundred percent shareholder return, uh, opportunistic share buybacks and variable dividends. So uh, this is kind of an exciting development when it comes to uh, you know, Synovus has value position and kind of where they, they think they could go from here. So as we kind of uh, review the, 
uh, their presentation. Maybe there's an opportunity here to kind of see a little bit more of uh, the value proposition and uh, maybe kind of get a little bit more familiar with their with their assets. So if we look um, on the oil sands part, so you can see we're going to do a deeper dive in this asset, Christina Lake, but you can see they have 235 to 255,000 barrels per day of production to end uh, 2023, a very low OPEX, uh, 750 to 9 per barrel, industry-leading SOR, CSOR, which is, stands for cumulative steam to a ratio, about 1.9, and they have also cogenerate cogeneration capacity of 100 megawatts. So what's really important about this is that also their peers, um, they also say, hey, this is the best in class asset in the th in thermal uh, with the lowest SOR, right? Um, and that's exciting because we're gonna do a that deeper dive to better understand Christina Lake. Foster Creek, uh, 180 to 200,000 barrels per day production, uh, slightly higher OPEX. This is an older asset, maybe not like as optimized as Christian Lake. Um, CSOR cumulative steam to our ratio is 2.5. Lloyd Thermal, uh, this came from the Husky acquisition, 100,000 to 10,000 barrels per day production, uh, much higher uh, OPEX, 15 to 17 dollars per, per flowing, a higher quality, lower viscosity than traditional oil sands. Um, yeah, so that's interesting. Sunrise. Again, this is from Husky Legacy, 45 to 50,000 barrels per day in production, uh, slightly higher um, cost per barrel on the OPEX side. Uh, they implementing Sonova's operating strategy to improve performance. And again, the reason why it says that it's probably because it's a Husky Legacy asset. Uh, and Lord Mr. Conventional Heavy Oil, uh, 17 to 22,000 barrels per day production, 40 to 43 per, per flowing on the OPEX side and the piloting CO2 AOR technology. So that's kind of what's going on there. Uh, a lot of opportunity here for uh, Christina Lake site optimization. We're going to be looking at a deeper dive on, on what they want to do there. So, so that's quite exciting. On the conventional side, uh, they they basically, as mentioned, Elmore, Wapiti, Kakwa, Northern Corridor. That's uh, So that's, in my understanding, that's the market there and Edson uh, Clearwater regions as well, where there's some development that's going on here. A really exciting kind of to see what, what's happening in the conventional focus uh, areas, especially in the Northern Corridor there. And of course, offshore, they have um, the Atlantic and Asia Pacific. This is mainly uh, White Rose Field and the uh, Liwan Gas Project. So those projects came with uh, the Husky acquisition. What I think is really interesting here is that uh, the white rose capital profile for first oil, um, it's quite fascinating here because there, there is quite a spend here. Like, so it says uh, just between 400 to $600 million uh, in 2023, in 2024 about that, and then it slightly increases. But at the same time, you know, the idea here is to produce uh, 45,000 barrels per day by late 2020s. And so th this is kind of a fascinating uh, realization for me personally, because, you know, they could have probably taken like, you know, 600, 600 and, and bought, bought those barrels now from um, from a company that, you know, um, uh, like a thermal producer in, in Alberta, but at the same time, uh, that's fine. You know, may maybe this is kind of their development strategy here by, by 2030, 2031. Um, and, and bring that production to essentially to those levels. And maybe there's some really good economics here where they want to meet the investment criteria at uh, 45 uh, WTI US, which is uh, very typical now of where the companies want to find themselves. Uh, and obviously there's optimization and growth capital of 600 million in 2023. So um, yeah, interesting project, but you know, if I was kind of to guess maybe uh, the, the core assets are maybe the thermal assets, as we saw in the numbers, but this is kind of something they're, uh, I guess, uh, committed to developing. And obviously on the Canadian manufacturing side, uh, lots of refining capabilities, so 81,000 barrels per day throughput, throughput capacity in Lloyd Mr. Upgrader, uh, 30,000 barrels per day in Lloyd Mr. Refinery and commercial fuels business as well. And then you have obviously the refining in the United States or so U.S. manufacturing, Lima, Ohio, very important 
uh, refinery there, Toledo, Ohio, so 180,000 barrels per day, 160,000 barrels per day, Superior, Wisconsin, right? So, so this is an important company for um, for the United States as as well as Canada. And uh, in Texas, obviously, 50% interest with uh, Philip 66 and Wood River, Illinois, um, as well. So 173,000 barrels per day uh, capacity. So uh, very exciting for the downstream business. Okay, and here you can see a little bit how there's diversified marketing strategy, uh, really nice uh, kind of matrix here, a some economics map and corporate guidance in 2023. So here, maybe I'll zoom in a little bit. Uh, they're talking about uh, Christina Lake, uh, 235 to 255,000 barrels per day. You can see how this asset is very important. This is the biggest producing asset uh, for Synovus and we're gonna cover it in a little bit more detail. All right, so now that we kind of uh, spent 20 minutes or so on getting familiar with um, with their corporate presentation, let's look at their Q2 and uh, you know try try to kind of assess what what took place there. So if we look at Q2, right now I'm sharing essentially their uh, it's a document called. Let's take a look at the name of this document so everybody can have a reference. It's called Synovus Energy Management Discussion and Analysis Unaudited for the periods ended June 30th. Everything in Canadian dollars. So if we go to the table here, so let's let's kind of look at the production volume. So uh, Q2 uh, production volumes were slightly down versus uh, last quarter, but uh, maybe there was some kind of like turnaround activity or something where you know, they will be kind of going back to their previous uh, production levels because that's kind of what we've been seeing so far, right? So perhaps there was some kind of like turnaround event. Um, on the downstream cr crude oil unit throughput, uh, elevated um, uh, flowing uh, per day relatively to Q1. And downstream production volumes obviously correlate with those numbers so you get about 572,000 BOEs per day. Um, on the revenue side, the revenues were pretty much in line with Q1 um, and so in 2023, but you saw like in 2022 oil prices were, um, uh, you know, they were like 120, 130 because of the Russia war in Ukraine. Um, and you can see here that the revenues could be as high as like uh, 19, right? And that's, this is 19 billion so th this is significant so if the company uh, assuming that q2 trade because here here's dollars and millions so this is 19 billion so back then i think the stock was maybe in um the the market cap would be like maybe in the 30s maybe 40 billion dollars and so that would suggest like a two times revenue type of evaluation right uh, which is very interesting here and uh, looks looks cheap so <clears throat> you can see cash from uh, operating activities. So although there was a kind of a negative number here in Q1, they did deliver in Q2 uh, close to $2 billion here. And adjusted funds flow, 1.9 billion. So that's that's great. This is um, about dollar per share. So about the $1 per share. And obviously if that's the case, you know, you, you know how many shares they have. So um, they have about, uh, 1.9 billion shares, I guess. Uh, yeah, 1.9 billion shares because the market cap is um, is about uh, 48 billion. So that makes sense. Um, capital investment, so about a billion per quarter, as you can see here. So that they delivered the same number the previous quarter. So that's good. Uh, you know, coming out of COVID, um, you can see how they were kind of ramping up a little bit the spend to and and now they basically stabilize which is uh, encouraging pre funds low so pre funds low were much lower in q1 um as a reference so they achieved about 897 million free funds low so that's free cash flow and uh, uh you know when the oil prices were elevated like in the hundreds there uh in q2 2022 they reached as much as 2.2 billion dollars in free cash flow so now they're about uh, 1 billion, let's say, 897 million. So with now oil prices being higher, one could expect that their free free cash flow uh, for Q3 perhaps would be closer to 
uh, Q4 um, 2022 numbers, so maybe about a billion. Uh, this would suggest, and maybe oil prices continue rising here, it could be as high as maybe 1.6 or 1.2, just like we saw in Q2 2021, as the prices were kind of increasing. So, so essentially what you have here, you have a situation right now that the company, uh, you know, if you start kind of combining those numbers, so in 2022, it was about $4 billion uh, free funds flow, so free cash flow. Uh, up until now, they got about 1.1. Um, would they be able to generate $4 billion in free cash flow in 2023? Maybe, maybe not. Depends on oil prices. But nevertheless, um, one could calculate the yield from here. So essentially, if you at 55, if uh, they're able to generate, let's say, um, you know, $5 billion, it could be closer to 10% free cash flow yield. But now it's a little bit kind of under that number. And so maybe that's the reason why they're they're kind of a little bit uh you know not performing as well but nevertheless like those numbers are um very significant like if you think about this uh, this is a lot of money to generate in free free cash flow free funds flow um prior to that you know this quarter was not maybe as strong but 1 billion here 2 billion here 2.2 billion here 1.8 billion here so extremely sensitive to oil prices and Obviously, as we as the oil prices are increasing right now, which is, I think, the increase from like 67, which is what we've seen in Q1, uh, kind of coming out of that bottom into Q2 as the oil prices, sorry, so Q2 into Q3 as the oil prices are rising right now, uh, one could wonder what what they're going to be able to achieve basically here. Would that be kind of an average of of this maybe, or or maybe not 2.2 billion a quarter because that will be like hundred twenty dollar oil uh, declining to hundred but um yeah it, it's a fascinating kind of you know uh, opportunity and then you start thinking within this context uh, as you look at the free funds law yeah they committed to essentially reaching the debt target which you know if they continue doing this at this pace how fast they're going to get to four billion dollars uh, in their debt uh, target so if their net uh, debt now is 6.5 so they need like two, three quarters to achieve their net target. And then they basically, by year end, they return 100% of the free cash flow to investors. That that could be a very realistic scenario here. Uh, another question here, you know, which is interesting because initially when I was showing the, when I was showing basically the, you know, the enterprise value and all that, um, we, we did a comparison with different companies. And so one of the questions could be, well, if you generate like, a billion dollars in free funds flow um and you know i want to be like very careful about how i frame it but they could be in a position where you know they could be buying they don't have to do it by any means because of vast vast resources they have and reserve life index of 30 plus years and significant free cash flow that they're generating already and opportunity for development and investment but nevertheless you know if they were you know acquire something they're gener generating the free cash flow to, to do that. So if they bought something like that's worth $2 billion or let's say $8 billion, this will be like maybe a two, three quarter kind of payout event where the free cash flow could go towards that. And this could add another maybe like 30,000 barrels per day to the production. Or, you know, if they go for something bigger, like buying something for eight, $9 billion, let's say, then it will take eight, nine quarters. So essentially two years to pay out. But if that company pays, let's say, yields or something similar, then they get essentially free optionality forever to to produce that asset. So it's going to be really fascinating to see what what's going to ha happen going forward, especially with such significant uh, free cash flow generation uh, by Sonovas here. So uh, you know, as, as we look kind of the net debt, so obviously we're at six point three. Uh, you can see that that number declined significantly over time here. Um, so, yeah, so in Q2 2021, uh, net debt was 12.39 billion, uh, and now it's half that, so it's 6.3 billion. And uh, we're basically a couple of quarters away from if we continue generating that 
uh, free funds low at that rate, it's probably going to be higher because the oil prices are higher. Uh, they're going to reach their goal and distribute uh, 100% of the free cash flow as they promised. So that, that's going to be fascinating to watch. So as we continue the conversation here and kind of looking at, at uh, you know, their, their quarters, uh, the, what they reported, I think it's a good opportunity now to go to their core asset, Christina Lake, and maybe take a look at what's going on over there. So right now I'm sharing, um, going to be sharing the presentation. It's called Sinovas Energy, Christina Lake in situ progress report. It's in the public domain. It was reported to uh, AER um, as part of the, the requirement. And, but I think it's an amazing opportunity to, uh, for people to get familiar with the asset, you know, because this, this information is in the public domain as part of the, as part of the AR directive point, uh, 054 here, 054 and a great opportunity for everybody to kind of, you know, get a better understanding of the Christina Lake asset, which is their, uh, which is their best producing asset essentially. So from last year, you can see the reserve live index was slightly lower. So. Uh, 29 years, which is still amazing. I think they reported 31 years in the previous presentation. Market cap was still $44 billion, so that's that's cool. But remember, they kind of reduced the debt level since then, so that's great. And again, uh, production 780, oil sense 580, now it's 600. So you can kind of see the, you know, the, the increased production a little bit to 600,000 barrels per day on the oil sense side. And upgrading and refining capacity is much higher now and mainly because of the acquisition they made, uh, I think, last year. Okay, so Christina Lake, uh, essentially, this is their asset cluster. Christina Lake look at north to foster kind of, uh, and, you know, to to the south of uh, Christina Lake. And you can see the essential process facilities here on the picture on the right. The recovery process they use uh, in Christina Lake is called uh, SACD, thermal, it's a thermal project. Uh, essentially, they use temperature. Um, uh, where they inject, essentially, they have an injector and producer, so two wells, uh, which they call a welker, and they land those wells essentially in uh, in the pay here of the McMurray. Uh, the the technology they use called SACD steam assisted gravity a drainage, and this is a process to recover oil from the McMurray formation. Um, now, before we kind of proceed to that, maybe we can use this opportunity to to maybe show a quick video. If you haven't seen my previous presentations, um, I showed this video before, but I think it could be helpful to, to maybe like visualize it a little bit more. So you can see here, um, they, they essentially kind of drill uh, two wells. So they drill like two wells here and, oh, why is it not playing? Okay, here we go. So and the an injector and producer and those kind of go into the mcmurray formation as shown in the video and you inject steam so you first you cement the the wells and then you inject steam and you drain the emulsion which is steam and oil together um because you kind of liquefy the the hockey puck kind of formation in the mcmurray and make it less viscous so you can drain downwards by gravity and there's many, many of those steam chambers and those well pairs that uh, they integrate, which is amazing technology. You can see the steam chambers kind of growing here, developing, and it takes many, many years to develop them as well. Uh, that's why you have a very high uh, life index reserve there. So, so this is essentially the technology they use. And, and now maybe it's a good opportunity for kind of uh, go back to, to the presentation and kind of see um, a little bit more about Christina Lake. So now we're back to the this uh, this picture, and you can kind of envision how the injector and producer go in, and how the recovery uh, is taking place. So steam is essentially injected into the upper well, where it heats the oil and allows it to drain to lower well. Oil and water emulsion pump to the surface and treat it. So here you have essentially cup rock steam heats the bitumen, and you get you see the steam chamber below. So here they show some of the dimensions. It could be as high as uh, 2600 uh, sorry as long as 2600 feet and as deep as uh, 820 feet so um and, and you have this cup rock which makes the operation extremely safe 
So this is historical performance for Christina Lake. And I'm really excited to, to see this graph because it's just, uh, it, it, I, th I find it, uh, I find it very beautiful. And, and it's just, um, it's exciting to see how the phases were integrated and how the team did an amazing job kind of bringing the asset online and, and achieving those results. So in green, essentially, you see uh, the oil rates um, on the left side. This is in cubes per day. So on this graph up to 20, you know, kind of beginning of 2022, you can see that they've essentially produced just over 40,000 cubes a day. Now to convert uh, cubes uh, to barrels, you multiply by 6.29. So that will be like you know the the range that they um, they committed to. So let's say if we take uh, forty thousand uh, forty times six point three, so it's about two hundred fifty thousand barrels per day, right? So and then um, you can see the steam increase over time as they basically kind of were bringing this to the line while integrating different phases, so introducing more and more pads, and you can also see how kind of uh, you know. Over the past 10 years, despite the low oil environment, the in the price environment, the asset continued to ramping up production. And, and that speaks to the kind of the low cost of supply of this asset, but also that probably the investors of today benefiting tremendously from, from the growth that this asset was able to achieve going into like a higher oil environment. So you essentially see phase A here, barely any production over the next like five years, seven years. You can see production ramping up, and then phase C, D, and E was a big, big event, uh, basically bringing production online, uh, optimization of those phases, phase F, G. Uh, you can see a turnaround event. So this this happened in the past. You can see this turnaround event where the facility goes offline, offline. But then you know as production declines, it also gets restored, and you can get that flush production effect and, and essentially growth over time as they bring in more pads. This is what it looks like uh, on the scheme map, Christina Lake. So you can see all their pads. Uh, you can see some of their neighbors, which is uh, very interesting and kind of maybe speaks a little bit to about what I you know, mentioned earlier, where you have the lake. This is Christina Lake, uh, Sonovas, Jackfish CNRL, and Christina Lake Mag on, on the kind of uh, east side of the lake. Um, th this, is, uh, this is quite fascinating. And there is Narrows Lake, which in my understanding is also kind of an asset uh, that belongs to Sonovas. So it's going to be interesting to see how that asset is going to get developed considering you have Christina Lake here uh, on, on the right side. Um, so if we look at the McMurray SACDPA Isopac map, you can see how their pads sitting in the sweet, sweet zones where you can see the development area and the pay cutoffs uh, with, um, with high porosity, high oil saturation, and essentially very nice space of where, where the oil actually sits. And you see significant opportunities for uh, developing more pads and increasing essentially, maybe not even increasing, but maybe sustaining production over time. So lots of opportunity for development and optimization here. So that's what uh, this, this pads look like uh, in, in the other uh, regions. And this is top gas isopac. So they, they could have some gas pockets here. So you can see the Kind of mitigate those uh, those uh, geologies, and this is the water isopac map where they do have maybe some water regions in in some of those pads where they're kind of mitigating those water regions as well. So this is seismic seismics within a project area that's been reported. Here's an interesting um, diagram of cross section uh, of uh, of the Christina Lake region. So. You can see the McMurray Sagdipe is essentially in green. And uh, notice here where it says uh, the the height, essentially. So you have uh, 345 meters to, let's say, 380 or so. So that's the pay of that resource, which is significant. It could be like size 30 meters, maybe even more. And that's where the oil is in, in that region. It's very predictable. And you can see, like as you can see on the map, as they bring those pads online, they basically just land them there like a, like a tuxedo cake from Costco, just kind of introducing those pads and keep growing this region, knowing exactly where, where the layer is, where the chocolate is. So. so this is a little bit more here. This is volume uh, volumes from the, from the asset. 
and this is some reservoir properties, right? So you can see reservoir depth, so 270 to 245 meters subsea. Uh, average Sagdipe could be up to 45, right? Up to 25 Kirby's project in approved development area. Porosity, just about 30% on average. Permeability up to 10, up to 8, right? Vertical permeability 7, 6, so very high permeability, very high oil saturations, 80, 75. Water saturation, which is basically um, the difference between 100 and uh, oil saturation, so 20, 25. And uh, original reservoir pressure is roughly 2.5 MPa and 12 degrees Celsius. That, so in those conditions where 12 degrees Celsius, uh, the oil is not mobile. So therefore, they're injecting steam to mobilize the oil. And so it can be drained by gravity. That's why it's called steam-assisted gravity drainage. So on this map, on this here, a map here, or a table here, you can see the recovery per pad. So they essentially disclose uh, all their pads uh, to the regulator and basically showcasing what you know the recovery factors are. So you, you, you're able to see um, basically like the area, the height, the permeability, porosity, uh, oil saturation, and produced original uh, oil in place. Uh, and uh, yeah, maybe there's like a legend here that could explain like all those, uh, all those, um, you know, bitumen in place, original bitumen in place, cumulative oil to December 2021, how much out of that was produced, the recoveries, uh, recovery percent, ultimate recovery, and recovery as a percent. So you can see kind of the idea that, um, you know, some pads like it looks like B17 here. It has uh, uh, very low recovery factors, while others have a little bit higher. But then they're so good at integrating those pads, as shown and in the oil production rates, is that um, you know basically you essentially have no decline on the overall asset because as they bring those pads online, they're basically kind of mitigating any declines on the asset itself by managing uh, pad integration as seen in this picture, which is remarkable. So, and, and that's why I think like, you know, there's, you know, um, this is the top SOR in the industry, 1.9. So for every barrel of oil, to produce every barrel of oil, you need 1.9 barrels of steam. Um, okay, so they have some non condensable gas co-injection. So they essentially mitigate SOR uh, and kind of lean zones with uh, NCG co-injection, so non condensable gas a game-changing concept because that requires less steam, less energy. So it's really good for, for performance. And here you can see um, increased NCG co-injection over time that really benefits their assets, kind of maintaining the pressure in the reservoirs uh, as they continue kind of the development of their fields. So this is plot plan. Uh, and this is what the main advantage essentially in SACD is that it's a very CAPEX intensive process. And here the CAPEX is paid for because Christina Lake is... Uh, in post payout status. So they basically generate enough revenues to essentially uh, pay out their, their asset. And that's what the issue is with like many, you know, greenfield developments right now in, in the in the sector because you don't see much activity and you don't see much, this type of facilities are being built anymore, uh, which are very valuable. So you can see phase H, uh, lots of equipment here, lots of lots of activity. Let's see what else is exciting here. Active gas injection. So they, they essentially disclose here how they manage the fields and how they, they operate them with the regulator. Plant development area. So, so here basically the showing um, producing in green, drilled in uh, this blue color, lockdown is in that, uh, I don't know, it's like an orange color, I guess. But you can see opportunity for development, just kind of expanding the, the pads here and kind of going a little bit further, I guess, north here based on this picture. But a very safe operation as, as it shows. Yeah, so anyway, hopefully kind of added a little bit value to explain uh, what, what Christina Lake is all about. And this is their top, top asset for uh, force and Novus Energy. So, so far, what we've done, we looked at the comparisons to, to other companies. We looked at their presentation in somewhat detail. 
we reviewed their Q2 operations, kind of we understood that they generated uh, 897 million free funds low. Back in um, 2022 Q2, they generated 2.2 billion in free funds low or free cash flow. And th th this is significant, right? Because this company trades relatively low valuation and generates significant amount of free cash flow. And that's kind of what, what, um, what people been alluding to when when they talk about this company but then again you know very often you will go on the bn and bloomberg and somebody will talk about uh, let's say sonovas or suncor and they will say well i prefer uh, canadian natural and stuff and so i think it's a good opportunity to kind of revisit what maybe other people are saying about the name and uh, some thought process like from you know uh, places like bn and bloomberg what some of the guests been, been saying about the company so um, so essentially uh in uh, may yeah so in may um eric uh, nadal of nine point energy fund he was on uh, bnn bloomberg this was his top pick um so he he mentioned that it's underperformed because of the issues in US, u.s refineries and this could be the um, probably the reason why there was a little bit less free cash flow in q1 um, and they have indicated they're in track to get back online. And it seems like they did because the performance was much different this time around in Q2. Um, he, back then, he had mentioned that CEO bought million dollars worth of stock. They have 30 years of inventory in heavy oil, which we've seen with our own eyes in the presentation. So I think it's like actually 31 years. Um, huge leverage to oil price. And we've seen that obviously in the presentation where, you know, when, when uh, oil prices are uh, over a hundred dollars, um, you generate two point two billion dollars in free free cash flow. Uh, so this is significant, right? When this quarter they reported eight hundred ninety seven or so million in free cash flow. Uh, once that reaches a certain level, investors will reap the free cash flow. So we confirmed in this presentation that that threshold will be essentially when they reach four billion dollars in debt and net debt, and at that point uh the the distribution will be 100 percent of free cash flow to investors so let's revisit again just kind of to confirm that point again if we look at the corporate presentation uh and and this diagram which i think is important i think that's what he's probably alluding to is that right now they're as mentioned here they're basically at 6.367 million uh so 6.3 billion essentially in net debt uh, they're going to be going to nine to that range, which is where they are right now. And right now they're paying down debt with 50% of the free cash flow and uh, buying back shares essentially, or maybe they'll issue a variable dividend. Um, now, once they reach four billion, they will be target 100% of shareholders. So, is this doable? Um, yes, it's doable because last quarter they reported 897 in free cash flow. If they do two more quarters like this, well, they're going to reach like four billion, let's say, uh, in uh, in their net debt target, uh, which suggests that they're going to return 100% of the share shares uh, shareholder returns, target 100% shareholder returns from the free cash flow. So, so that statement is uh, is realistic, and uh, and very much kind of uh, achievable here, I think. Uh, based on current oil prices and where we are today. So again, let's kind of revisit some other statements that were made. Um, it's a six time multiple in fair value. Uh, yield is 2.57%. Uh, and analyst target back then was that the stock should be at $30, $29.78. Uh, then in back in May, Paul Harris was uh, um, on BNN. He did, did not recommend this company. But he said, because of ESG pressures, Big Cup Oil has decided to buy back shares, paying down debt, increase dividends, keep CapEx reasonable. Not bad tone ever over the long term, as oil production is not increasing, so prices will stay higher. As in like Sonova, since it was spun off, he owns the preferred CNQ. And this is a very common theme we hear that company, uh, that um, investors prefer Canadian Natural to this name. But I mean, as we've seen, um, based on this presentation and value proposition, 
perhaps they're not they're, perhaps they're you know they're not right about uh, assessing the exact situation um so brooke thackeray was uh back in may also on bnn he said buy on witness great company but share price driven by oil price which is which is true which is true a uh, way to buy not a good time to be in energy so he said it back in may uh, since May, oil prices are high significantly, so I'm not sure how to, if to take this comment seriously. Uh, back in May, also uh, Robert Gill was uh, talking about Sinovas. He actually said to buy this name, high quality, one of the better Canadian oil and gas producers, fairly strong balance sheet, small dividend, uh, stock price uh, drop makes valuation more attractive, tremendous amount of free cash flow, which which is what we've seen. Increasing dividends can buy here below 20 looks even better. Well, the stock right now, I think it's what, 20, $25. So yeah, good on you, Robert. Uh, that was, uh, I guess, good advice for, for that time frame. Um, back in uh, May as well, uh, Michael Sprung was on BNN Bloomberg. He also talked about, you know, he also recommended to buy. He said the high clear dividend over 30% last quarter, uh, even though it's not a huge dividend, but you know, it's a nice increase, I guess. Uh, trades a decent P of 7.5, pays a 2.5 dividend. Yeah, that's correct. And, and Jamie Murray back in April said to hold the name, not by herself, but just to hold. Trouble, trouble in the last couple of quarters, so prices will hang in. And as cash flow over two to four years, you will do okay. He owns in Q. And again, we see the same theme. We see the same theme that, um, uh, you know, CNQ is kind of the preferred company based on those comments. Uh, but you know, maybe, maybe, maybe it shouldn't be, I don't know. So hopefully um, this video added a lot of value to, to people kind of in our community that, uh, um, oh, sorry, I'll just, yeah. So hopefully it added a lot of value to people in our community. Uh, again, uh, this is uh, my my handle on YouTube is Razor Oil. Uh, my handle on uh, Twitter is also Razor Oil. And uh, yeah, um, let me know what you think in the comments uh, about what was shared. Again, I'll uh, I'll present this slide um, here that the information that the share is aggregated as you've seen i collected it from uh, from online it's public domain and uh, this is my way of adding value to the community and sharing what uh, what been seen about this name and this is for educational purposes only please uh, educational purposes only uh, do not act on anything that was shared don't understand or, or interpret it as investment advice and do please do your own due diligence and talk to a professional advisor regarding any investment strategy. So this is important because, um, you know, there there's no there's just no guarantees, right? You you've seen the fluctuation in free cash flow, but in higher oil environment, uh, it seems like those companies are doing quite well. So this is something uh, to be mindful of. Also, um, as as we shared, and this is something I would like to kind of conclude with, because I think it's extremely powerful. Um, this is an extremely important company, I think, in North America. As you can see here, based on the volumes, uh, think about this. They produce close to 800,000 barrels per day and refine about 745,000 barrels through Canada, through the network, uh, in the United States, delivering, um, you know, energy to to society that that demands demands this product. Um, and, and I think it's it, it's important to to recognize that this is an important company and, and, and kind of appreciate, you know, that they exist and know, know about them. Uh, and uh, yeah, hopefully uh, this presentation was able to add uh, much value. Again, there's, look, uh, in my view, there's not much they have to do here when it comes to m and And they have like reserve live index of 31 years. Uh, it's a fascinating name, right? 31 years of reserve live index, uh, 8.9 billion BOEs. Um, Proved and probable reserves in 2022. Um, and so what do you do? What do you do when you generate such significant free cash flow? They basically told us we're going to achieve 4 billion in net debt, and then we're going to return everything to shareholders. The one big question is going to be, um, you know, as they continue to generate the significant free cash flow, 
and we saw with uh, the east coast of shore uh, where they're going to spend about, about i think 600 million dollars um, to achieve uh, uh, something like 45,000 barrels per day production by 20 2030 or so um, the question is going to be don't you have better opportunities maybe in canada to to do something with that free cash flow and so i think we've heard on um, you know, Cole Smith was um, talking about basically, uh, you know, the, the company's management being brave and taking actions. Uh, uh, he's a friend on, on Twitter, as you know, and others been kind of, you know, um, having other ideas on uh, what uh, what this company should be doing with the free cash flow. But nevertheless, it seems like they're in good situation as the oil price uh, improves, but uh, able to basically... Um, you know, if they continue to generate that free cash flow that they did last quarter, they will be very close to being debt free in like let's say four quarters. That's basically what it comes down to. And once you're debt free, you you you're a very different company with uh, uh, much less stress. So hopefully, uh, I was able to add lots of value to to everyone. Thank you for uh, for listening. Please um, like and share, and maybe let others know that. You know, we're doing those videos and sharing. Uh, I don't talk about this name only. I talk about uh, other names in the oil and gas sector. And obviously, we have spaces on Fridays that we, we have uh, on Twitter. Uh, just sharing information, sharing knowledge, um, talking within the community, becoming better kind of uh, maybe stewards and, and uh, people that understand the energy sector a little bit better. And so this is kind of my attempt to do a little bit my own kind of review due diligence spend a little bit of time i find that when i um, explain something i learned i remember it better i am kind of much more knowledgeable about uh, the money flows which is not you know i'm i'm an engineer but i'm not like a financial expert by any means but uh, i find myself learning a lot and when i'm able to explain it to people it, it kind of gives me a little bit more of a, a strength to maybe uh, understand the sector a little bit better and maybe value companies uh, as we go forward. So thank you all so much for your support. Uh, have, a nice, uh, have a nice evening and day and wherever you are. I see we have lots of fans from uh, Australia and overseas in the United States. So very grateful to everyone. Thank you so much for your support. And uh, yeah, not investment advice by any means, educational purposes only. Uh, comment, uh, let me know your thoughts. Maybe you have some ideas for improvement. Maybe something I could share a little bit more or less. Maybe you enjoyed hearing certain um, content more than other things. But uh, we'll be very happy to hear from everyone with your suggestions because I'm just, you know, just a guy that uh, trying to add value and being a good member of our community. So all the best, everyone, and uh, have a wonderful uh, day, evening, wherever you are, or morning. Thank you.